In this video, we're going to talk about the process of glycolysis, but first we need to look at reactions called oxidation-reduction reactions. So <clears throat> where this falls in in terms of sort of our broader concepts is this idea of transformation of matter, all right? And so we've talked about energy some, and so, you know, the sort of the opener or intro slide is of these runners, and you know, the basic idea here is is that the, you know, what forms um, do we see the energy in cellular energy, right? So what, so how do we extract um, and move and transform energy from, say, something like glucose and end up with it being translated into kinetic energy, such as movement? So if we look at an overview of what we call cellular respiration, Okay, so cellular respiration is, in a lot of ways, it's this, it's it's a combination of things. So we're going to have glycolysis, right, which is up here, right, and it's shown actually right here. Okay, so here's our glycolysis with glucose to pyruvate. This is just showing us there's other ways we can pull energy out. Okay, and then we have the citric acid cycle. Okay, sometimes referred to as the TCA cycle. And then we have the electron transport chain down here. Okay, and we're going to end up making ATP along the way. And it is the uh, ATP then that we can use as sort of the, our source of potential energy that allows us to elicit changes in matter. Okay, so anyways, we're going to go through this whole process, but today really we're focused on just glycolysis. All right, this is where we're really going to focus our effort today. Okay, so we need to talk about oxidation reduction reactions. Okay, and so the basic idea is, is that we're going to take electrons that are shared equally in carbon-carbon bonds or even carbon-hydrogen bonds, and we're going to move those electrons to carbon-oxygen bonds where those electrons are not equally shared. All right, and so what we if we look at this, we look at the shading, right? Our carbon carbon, these electrons are equally spread out around those carbons. Okay, now because the oxygen atom is more electronegative, the electrons spend more time near there. They also spend more time closer to the nucleus at lower potential energy. So we're going to move the electrons from high potential energy here to low potential energy here. All right. And so if you think about it, <clears throat> right, when you breathe in, you're taking in oxygen, and when you breathe out, you breathe out carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide that you exhale, the carbon atoms come from something like glucose, right? They come from an organic molecule that your body has, has used. So let's look at a simplified way of thinking about redox reactions, okay? So they're oxidation-reduction reactions and they happen in tandem All right, so we have oxidation reduction and the basic idea is, is that if I have X all right, with an electron here and it's going to undergo a reaction with Y and I end up with X and Y over here okay if I transfer my electron to Y so it's here, okay? Then my x now doesn't have one, right, over on this side of my equation, all right? So what we want to think of then is, is that x became oxidized, all right? Okay, so that's my electron. So what we want to also think of here is x goes like so and y goes like so. Okay, so X is being oxidized in my reaction. Oxidized during reaction. All right, this refers to the donation of electrons. So it was my donor. All right, now my Y is being reduced. All right, so it's reduced during my reaction. And this refers to 
the acceptor of my electrons. All right, so that's the basic idea of the oxidation reduction reaction. So we have a donor of electrons, an acceptor of electrons. So this can also refer to when we take something like our previous example where we had carbon, carbon versus carbon, oxygen. Okay? And so here, right, we take this electron, and I'm just going to draw it sort of in a path, kind of like so around here, and it should be kind of equally spread around my carbons. Well, now, if I say that they're sort of closer in here, and then they go out, what we can imagine now is, is that these electrons spend more time at a lower energy level, right? And because the electrons are spending more time with the oxygen, the oxygen has become reduced, even though it's only, you know, it's not 100% of the time, right? It's, it's a partial part of the time. So, oxidation reduction, then, you want to focus on a donor and an acceptor, okay? The donor is what is giving up the electrons and is being oxidized. The acceptor is what is accepting the electrons or gaining the electrons and is being reduced. Okay, so here's another way to look at this, all right? Often we make oxygen, all right? We take oxygen as we, and it is converted into water. So that's what happened to the oxygen you breathed in, okay? So again, now we have oxygen. They're shared equally, all right? And we're going to end up with water, and if we end up with HO, you'll notice the oxygen is now reduced. It has gained more time with electrons than it had previously. Okay, So this is sort of, again, illustrating that partial gained electrons as a reduction. Okay, So it can be either a complete gain or loss of electrons or a partial gain or loss, but it's still oxidation reduction. Now... The other thing you should be thinking of is that when you transfer these electrons, you transfer energy, right? Energy is also moved with them. Okay, so if we look at sort of metabolism, all right, so here's my carbohydrate. Let's say it's glucose. We're going to undergo catabolism, so we have all of these intermediates, all right, and so as we move along, this six-carbon carbohydrate is converted into carbon dioxide, and water. All right, that's our products. But in the meantime, we're going to take electrons and we're going to move those electrons to electron carriers. We're going to generate high energy ATP, right? This molecule with high potential energy, okay? So, if we increase, so if we take AMP or let's go with ADP, right, which has lower potential energy than ATP, okay? So, my carbohydrate here has lots of potential energy, but when it's down here at CO2 and water, it has lost a lot of that potential energy. So the carbon has lost its potential energy. Since we can't create or destroy the energy, that energy is now present in ATP. These things called electron carriers, we'll visit about what those are in a bit. So, we've moved the energy somewhere else. All right, so let's look at sort of an energy ladder. All right, so this is change in free energy over here on my y-axis. And this is sort of the progress of my glycolysis, right, from here to here, acetyl-CoA synthesis, and then the citric acid cycle, okay? Now, what I want you to notice is, is that zero is sort of where we're starting, okay? And we're going to give off energy, right? It's going to, if Gibbs free energy is negative, remember, that means that it is spontaneous or an exergonic reaction, right? We're, we're taking energy from the glucose, and down here, we should think of as having sort of CO2 and water, okay? Now, <clears throat> initially in glycolysis, we actually take ATP and we add phosphates to the glucose to energize it, and that's why we kind of move up. So this beginning part is endergonic. Then there's a big drop in energy, 
And what happens is, is that we're going to transfer electrons to an electron carrier called NADH. So in this case, we take NAD plus, and we're going to add two hydrogens to it plus electrons. All right, so it's NADH. Okay, so the NAD accepts or gains two electrons and is reduced to NADH, which is the high energy form of this electron carrier. All right. So we're going to, every time we see a big drop down in energy, right, so if we notice here, for example, all right, and here, we see that we're making an NADH. We're doing an oxidation reduction reaction, okay? The ATP is often corresponds to smaller drops, except in this one right here where we do both at the same time, okay? Now, this is the overview of glycolysis, all right? And so we want to think of it as we're doing just this part of the overall entire cellular respiration. So let's start with just a piece of it, all right? So this phase is referred to as the preparatory phase with consumption of 2 ATP. So what we're doing is, is we're adding energy to glucose. So we're increasing the potential energy of our glucose and in doing so we make it less stable. So we make it easier to break down. So we take ATP and it goes to ADP and we phosphorylate glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. So that consumes or uses one ATP. All right. So the energy difference between ATP and ADP is now here in glucose 6-phosphate. So that's the exact reaction we did when we were just discussing energy, right? So when we talked about energy coupling. So the ATP to ADP is an exergonic reaction. Glucose to glucose 6-phosphate is endergonic, all right? We then rearrange glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. We then consume another ATP, all right? So ATP to ADP is exergonic fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is endergonic. So now we have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and it is high in energy, right? It's got high potential energy and we're getting ready to break it, which is why there's sort of this shown here. Okay, we're about ready to snap this molecule into Now, phase two is the cleavage phase, okay? Now, during the cleavage phase, we split our six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules. All right? So we're going to split it into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. The dihydroxyacetone phosphate is converted to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. All right? So basically, we do the initial split and then we convert the dihydroxyacetone to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. All right, so this is the cleavage phase, and so now we have two molecules, and each is three carbons, right? So each of them are three carbons large. Okay, so we started with six total in one molecule. Now everything is going to occur twice, because we have two molecules, three carbons each. All right, so now we get the energy payoff phase. Remember, what we've done so far is we have increased the potential energy of our glucose now we and then we split it into two three carbon molecules and now we're going to pull the energy out so there's two columns of molecules here they are identical to each other this is simply showing us that everything occurs twice right we made two glyceraldehyde three phosphates so the first step all right of our payoff phase is we're going to take an NAD and convert it to NADH. So that's an oxidation reduction reaction. NAD plus is accepting electrons and becoming NADH. We also attach an inorganic phosphate and we end up with 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. The next step is ADP to ATP. So now we're reversing the reaction we did previously. So we're going to take the 1-phosphate, so it's 1,3-bisphospho, which means there's two phosphates at the 1 and 3 positions. The 1 from the 1 is transferred to ADP to make ATP. Okay? 
So that's an exergonic reaction in terms of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to 3-phosphoglycerate. It's an endergonic ADP to ATP. All right. Now you'll notice over here the same exact thing is happening to our other glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So we've done two energy outputs, right? So we have an exergonic glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. The energy from that exergonic reaction ended up in NADH. We then did a substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation. And I'll talk to you about this in class. All right. So we did a substrate level phosphorylation, which is how we transferred that phosphate. Now we're going to do two rearrangements. So 3-phosphoglycerate is converted to 2-phosphoglycerate. 2-phosphoglycerate is converted to 3-phosphoenyl pyruvate. All right, so 2-phosphoglycerate is converted to phosphoenyl pyruvate. We then do substrate level phosphorylation again. We transfer the phosphate from phosphoenyl pyruvate to ADP to make the ATP. We end up with pyruvate. Same thing happened over here, so we now have two pyruvates or two pyruvic acids. So product then is we got four ATPs, right? We got two NADH, and we got two pyruvates. Okay, that's just from the payoff phase. Remember, we consumed two ATPs in the investment phase, right, the very first phase of this. So we only have two net ATP that we have gained. All right, so let's have a look. Glycolysis gives you two ATP by substrate level phosphorylation, and we get two NADH from oxidative phosphorylation, which will, equivalent, which will be the equivalent of five ATP eventually. So it's the equivalent of seven total ATP. Okay, We're now, The next step in this is going to be acetyl-CoA synthesis, which gives us no ATP but 2-NADH, which we can convert later to 5-ATP. The citric acid cycle will give us 2-ATP and 6-NADH, 2-FADH, which will give us about 20 ATP total. Okay, So this is the net number of ATP right here for glycolysis. Remember we generated four but we used two so the net is two. Alright so once we're done all right, with glycolysis, it, glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm which is out here. We're now going to move into the mitochondria and continue our work. All right? So we're going to make acetyl coenzyme A and that occurs as we cross, as our molecule crosses into the mitochondria. All right, and then we're going to do some work in the matrix. Okay, so here's the matrix of my mitochondria. Here's my pyruvate. All right, and what, what's going to happen is, is as we move this thing in, all right, we're going to transport it in. We are going to do an oxidation reduction reaction, right? NAD plus to NADH. We're going to remove a carbon dioxide, right? This is this low energy form of carbon that we talked about earlier, and coenzyme A is going to be attached, and so we generate acetyl-CoA. We get two of these for each glucose, or one for each pyruvate. So we get one acetyl-CoA for each pyruvate. We generated two pyruvate from, glycol from glycolysis, therefore it is two acetyl-CoA per glucose. All right, so this is where we are on our chart, all right, and so next time we will pick it up with the rest of it.